All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I'm pleased to introduce our guest this week, Dan Miller. Dan is the Executive Vice President of Gabelli Funds, Lead Portfolio Manager of the Gabelli Pet Parents Fund, the Gabelli Focus Growth and Income Fund, and a member of the investment team for the Closed End and Separate Accounts businesses. For those of you out in the audience, as always, do please feel free to post those questions and comments in that live chat section throughout the presentation. But keep in mind, we generally like to hold those questions until we get to the end of things, just to make it nice and smooth for us. Without anything further from me, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Dan, and we can jump into things today. Thank you, Graham. Uh, nice to be here with all of you today. Even though I can't see you, I, I trust that um, this is a, a pretty cool um, audience based on the questions that I've uh, already heard from Graham and uh, I've heard from a few of you that have sent me the email uh, introduction. Um, hopefully we can keep it somewhat um, brief in my remarks and then open it up for questions and and um, answer uh, whatever's on your mind today. Um, I thought I'd start with maybe my background, talk a bit about uh, our firm, uh, and then get into uh, the idea that um, the pet economy uh, is a pretty interesting place to be invested at the moment. Um, so I've been with Gabelli Funds and related um, uh, groups for about 19 years now, if you can believe it. Uh, I'm home here uh, in my office um, in Stanford, Connecticut, but uh, and I've lived here for about the same uh, period of time. But I grew up in a small town in Florida called Lakeland. Uh, was uh, very fortunate to attend uh, school, uh, college in Miami, uh, where I met Mario Gabelli. Uh, my last uh, month of school, uh, when he was on campus speaking to the board of trustees about uh, the portion of the school's endowment that he was managing. I was the student rep to the board of trustees at that time, and the president of our college said, Mario, I want you to meet Dan Miller. He's one of our um, talented uh, finance majors. We had a conversation, and long story short, I was hired. Uh, packed up my car and uh, moved to Rye, New York, where uh, Gabelli has been based uh, for the past 20 plus years. And I began in the operations department, uh, kind of worked my way through various roles in sales and research, did some banking, um, began uh, managing assets for clients uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, Graham mentioned several of the funds that, that I've worked on. Um, and really, it's been kind of an interesting journey learning Mario's investment process, philosophy, um, approach to just running a business also, uh, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, uh, I've been uh, privileged to uh, not just um, work for Mario uh, in various roles and be an investor, but also to help run businesses. Um, I was nominated to the board of a, of a public telephone company about seven or eight years ago, uh, became chairman CEO of that. Uh, business, um, built it, we sold it for about a 3x return. Um, and uh, I've been involved in some other projects that I'm happy to talk about as well. Um, maybe about the firm. Uh, Mario Gabelli started uh, the uh, the first business, which was a sell side uh, brokerage, Gabelli and Company in 1977. He was an analyst uh, for about 10 years prior to that, covering auto parts and farm equipment. Uh, very good analyst, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, started this firm as a, a one-man shop, uh, marketing his investment ideas, different format than, than we use today, of course. Um, and, and then began managing money, um, kind of one client at a time. There was a CEO of an auto parts company that he was covering and had known for uh, a while, who said, Mario, why am I trying to pay you commissions? At that time, it was probably 25 cents a share when I can just give you a check, here's a million dollars, earn me a return and I'll pay you a fee. And so we got into that business managing separate accounts in, in 1977, 78. Um, we have a terrific long-term record in what we call our all cap value with a catalyst approach. Um, and I'll talk a bit about private market value with the catalyst, uh, which is kind of the uh, predominant uh, investment uh, philosophy for most of our client portfolios and funds. Uh, he began managing a hedge fund in 1985 in a merger arbitrage uh, strategy. Uh, merger arbitrage, for those of you that don't know, is investing in announced deals. Zoom that still has phone calls that ring. Um, 
Uh, merger arbitrage is investing in announced deals or takeovers. Uh, typically in a cash deal, you just go along the target, you capture a spread over time, uh, non-correlated to the equity markets, typically does well in a rising rate environment. Um, in 1986, uh, he launched uh, the first mutual fund, that was the Gabelli Asset Fund, uh, and that's still a $2 billion uh, or so uh, portfolio today. Uh, as a firm, we manage about 33 or 34 billion of assets, uh, almost entirely in equities. Uh, we have 20 billion or so in open and closed end funds, uh, and another obviously 13 or so billion dollars in uh, separate accounts on behalf of endowments like uh, Miami, uh, but also uh, high net worth individuals uh, and other. Um, we have about 200 staff globally. Um, but most of us based in, in or around Rye, but uh, have offices in London, in Tokyo. Uh, we have research teams in Palm Beach and St. Louis, uh, Chicago, Nevada. And uh, of that 200 or so staff, uh, there are probably 35 research analysts, which um, is really the backbone of how we generate returns. Uh, each of them cover an industry most of them cover industries um, and they do that globally. So for example, we have someone that covers the broadcasters, someone that covers uh, medical devices and they, they do that globally, all cap, micro, small, mid, large, and, and mega, of course. Um, very talented team of, of traders that support the investment uh, staff. Uh, there are probably 20 or so of us that manage portfolios uh, in different formats and styles. I mentioned uh, private market value with the catalyst um, being the kind of predominant investment philosophy or approach that, that we use. I would, I would guess that it's, it's, it's um, 30 of the 33 billion or so is it kind of value with the catalyst. Um, and what that means simply is the price that we think an informed investor maybe a private equity investor might pay to acquire a business in its entirety, a uh, multiple of EBITDA or cash flow, maybe revenues in a higher uh, growing, faster growing uh, industry, not be fine today more often. Um, that, that is the private market value of a business, the price someone would pay to acquire the entire business, as opposed to what a share um, is trading at today in the public markets. And then when we decide to, before we decide to make an investment, we think about the potential catalyst or event that might surface um, the discount between the current public market price and what we perceive or believe uh, the private values to be. And so I'll give you some examples when I get into the pet fund and talk about where we're allocating capital there today. But it's, it's a process that's really worked well for us um, in kind of you know, different periods. Clearly the last 10 years value has not been um, uh, the most inspiring place um, to be allocated because you've had multiple expansion given a very low rate environment on technology and other growth uh, related um, industries. I think it, that's changing. And, and, we're, and we can talk about that if you have any questions. An important element to, I think what we do and have done better than others is have a very intense focus on knowing the management teams that not just run a business, but also are involved in an industry. So we might um, be familiar with the CEO and CFO of a small cap gas utility company in upstate New York, who might inform how we view and think about the rest of the larger gas utility companies throughout the country. And so it's kind of Mario's um, um, really um, experienced and, and unique um, ability to ask the right questions, get the right information, um, of course, in a um, uh, reg FD world, um, and, but understand the moving pieces, how fundamentals are changing, how regulations um, 
are impacting how the way a business might be positioned to grow over a three to five year period. How companies might be thinking about allocating capital or undertaking financial engineering. Are they interested perhaps in spinning off a business that isn't getting multiple today in the public markets? And so as we've gotten to know management teams really well um, over a prolonged period of time, decades, um, we've been able to, to kind of invest alongside certain people that we think um, have been good stewards of capital for public shareholders. And, and that's really an interesting um, way to look at stock investing today, I think, um, when so many of us um, are overloaded with information from Twitter um, and blogs and great websites like this who are able to pass along information to us. In any case, I wanted to kind of use that as a transition um, to talk about someone named Bill Stiritz, who is someone that is in our Gabelli Gamco uh, Hall of Fame, someone that we have been invested with for probably 40 years. Um, Bill ran a company called Ralston in the mid 80s. It was a conglomerate. Uh, they were obviously involved in human food, but also pet food. Um, he engineered a series of spin-offs, um, uh, share buybacks to surface value. One of those was the sale of the Ralston Purina pet food business to Nestle that occurred in, in 2001 for $10 billion. Um, and it was really at that point in time that our team uh, began to hone in on the very attractive um, characteristics of the pet economy, as, as we call it today. Um, pet economy, including not just pet food, but pharmaceuticals, um, supplies. Now you even have pet insurance, of course, and we can talk more about that too. But um, it's really been a growing industry, um, one that's consolidated, that I think has uh, benefited uh, shareholders um, because there's been some rich multiples. In fact, um, over the last um, two years, there have been about 100 deals um, uh, that have taken place, 25 public companies uh, in the last couple of years that have merged or been acquired in the, in the pet economy uh, with multiples that have ranged between 18 uh, and 20 times EBITDA, uh, three to five times uh, revenues, very healthy multiples. Um, and I think they're deserved um, because the category is growing and it's attractive and it's relatively uh, mature. Um, some of the big, the uh, biggest deals, uh, PetSmart and BC Partners uh, combined in an $8.7 billion transaction. Uh, BCA Antec, uh, the symbol for it was WOOF, W-O-O-F, symbol is now being used again by a different company, uh, was, was purchased by Mars uh, for about $9 billion. Uh, and of course, Blue Buffalo, a uh, well-known deal. Uh, Mills paid about $8 billion uh, a couple of years ago for that one. So we launched the, the Belly Pet Parents Fund uh, April 1st of 2019. Uh, the symbol, if you want to follow along on our performance, is P-E-T-Z-X. Uh, it's an open-end mutual fund. Uh, it's long only, but it's global, actively managed, uh, relatively concentrated. Uh, we're about 30 names. Uh, of which 10 or so are outside the US, uh, where there's probably more of an opportunity, uh, multiple expansion and earnings growth. Um, let me first maybe define the market. Um, the, the, the US market for pets um, is about 85 million households today. Um, at least one pet in 85 million households, pretty big number. 68% of families, in fact, have at least one pet. And that compares, by the way, to just 42 million families, so roughly half, um, that have a child under the age of 25. There are about 95 million cats in the US, 90 million dogs, 20 million birds, 140 million fish, and about seven and a half million horses. Horses are uh, actually a pretty good market uh, because of the amount of care that they require. Um, the number of pets has been growing about 5% a year. Uh, we think that continues, particularly in the current environment where we all spend more time at home, uh, less time on airplanes, less time traveling, less time on vacations, more time on social media uh, and on our computers and iPads uh, that have 
separated us from uh, our friends and family and uh, pets have kind of filled that always important, more important than ever um, uh, interaction and companionship. So um, in fact, 67% of, of pet owners say that uh, their cat or dog is their best friend. Um, there are some great stats out there about how much is spent on, on Valentine's Day on, on pets. It's a couple hundred million dollars. Um, so show you a picture if you can see it. This is, this is my dog. That's Fanny, Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> um, in any case, um, so let's talk about some numbers here. Um, as, as we as humans think about um, taking care of ourselves, our health and our wellness, we're doing the same thing uh, for our pets. So uh, natural and organic uh, pet food, um, curated, fresh, um, uh, sent to our doors um, every week, like we do with human food. Um, that's a very attractive and uh, uh, growing market. Um, since, uh, since, uh, 2007, the U S pet industry has grown about three times that of GDP and a big piece of that about $80 billion is in pet food. Globally, the pet economy is about $200 billion today. We think that reaches about $250 billion three to four years out much higher in places like Asia, um, where, um, the idea of having uh, a companion dog is really just kind of. Um, coming into the mainstream. Technology, uh, very important element here, uh, not just in terms of how we consume pet products, including food, uh, auto pay, auto ship on Chewy and Amazon, but also in, in new ways that we interact, electronic dog collars, tracking devices, using your phone to measure how many steps your, your dog is taking around, monitor their heart rate, monitor medication, um, so lots of cool technology that, that we can talk about. Um, maybe I'll get into a couple of companies uh, and I know that um, we wanna have questions. So um, I'll run down some of the names that we own in the portfolio. Happy to talk about them in more detail. Um, our largest um, position today, which is about 9% of, of the fund uh, is a terrific small cap called Pet IQ. The symbol is P-E-T-Q. Um, they started out in business as a reseller of uh, uh, flea medications. Uh, the owners are entrepreneurs, um, really smart, dynamic uh, individuals out of the Midwest who uh, were selling into Costco, have grown their portfolio of products now to several hundred, are now manufacturing products. But most interesting to me, and the reason why we, we think that Pet IQ is going to be a great compounder in the next three to five years is. They're, they've gotten into the retail business. They made an acquisition a couple of years ago and are now growing um, a, a, um, a retail footprint um, in stores like Walmart, that's their biggest partner at the moment, uh, where they provide easy, quick, affordable, basic veterinary services. Less than half, less than half of our pet population sees a vet in an average year. And what Pet IQ has figured out is that if you're going to the store, you're going to Walmart to buy basic um, products for yourself, you can take your dog with you, drop her off at the front, pick her up in half an hour for $100, you get an annual visit. And that's important. So um, we think that Pet IQ is attractive. It trades at just 12 or 13 times uh, this year's EBITDA. EBITDA should be growing in the 15, 20% range. Um, and they've done, they've done very accretive um, deals on um, the last couple of years. Um, our second, third, and fourth positions are all kind of interchangeable by the day. Um, they include Chewy, uh, which is obviously the, the very large and uh, successful online retailer, uh, pure play in the pet market. Um, that's getting into um, new areas like uh, uh, medications, um, Elanco Health, uh, and Covetris. Uh, which was spun off of Henry Shine uh, a couple of years ago and is focused on the vet practices. Also, by doing software and technology, they have a platform called Vets First Choice, uh, 
which is just terrific and in, in the very early innings uh, of allowing pet owners to talk with the vets and ensure better compliance for kind of health uh, regimes. Um, small cap name, I'll, I'll throw it out there before I stop talking, uh, is kind of our fifth biggest uh, position is one called Kindred Biosciences. Uh, the symbol is K-I-N, it's really a micro cap um, that has figured out how to take um, the process for getting human drugs through the FDA and apply it to the pet market at a pace that's really one one hundredth uh, the amount of time. And so they've got various applications that are coming to market or already in market for things like atopic dermatitis, a skin condition that's very common in pets. Um, we think this stock is, is, um, is very attractively valued. It's probably one of the last uh, remaining public pure play small caps we think is ripe for consolidation. Um, the stock today is trading at $4.90. It's probably worth 10 to 15. Um, and Graham, I think with that, I'll just stop talking and open it up for questions if that's okay. Definitely. And for those of you out in the audience, uh, do please let us know uh, if you have pets hanging out at home, what you have, uh, who your apparent uh, potentially best friends are, uh, if they are your best friend there. Uh, as far as questions go, uh, we do have a question lined up from Jackie, uh, who came in here uh, even before we started uh, to pose this question. And that would be, what are uh, the most underrecognized important elements of value investing? So, for example, we all know, you know, basic things to look for, e.g., you know, low PE, manageable leverage, things like that. But what are some of the important elements that usually go unaddressed or unresearched by my novice investors? Well, thanks for the question, Jackie. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I think I'll touch on two two elements. Um, one I, I discussed already, which is the idea that you should gain some insight, insight into how management uh, is thinking about allocating capital. I mean, value isn't just on paper. It's not just looking at a model. It's not just looking at a PE ratio or an EBITDA multiple and thinking about stock being cheap. Value is also in buying a business below what you think it's worth. And so the idea of what it's worth should be based on some future assumption of how um, that business will evolve over time. Um, in some of my small cap um, portfolios, for example, um, a year ago, I began aggressively buying Shake Shack. And that's a business that nobody would think of as being a value stock. Um, certainly wasn't cheap on most valuation metrics. Um, but I understood how management was adapting to COVID uh, by introducing um, uh, new technology for um, delivery services, for pickup windows, uh, new menu items, engaging with customers on social media, um, and, and considering how they were going to open new locations in a way that would fit kind of the new, the new normal. And, and so, you know, we, we were buying that stock. And um, I think I think that's often um, missed. And in, in when most people talk about value investing, they, they think about stock trading at two times book. Um, cool, um, that, that works too. But I think the element of understanding how management, whether you have a direct opportunity to speak or you're listening to conference calls, reading transcripts, uh, listening to webinars, uh, understanding how, how a management team is thinking about um, allocating capital it doesn't mean they have to have a growth plan. It could be um, a company that is uh, going to refinance their debt in a way that's creative or, um, or thinking about slimming down by selling off non-core assets. Um, and they, might, they might communicate that. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about one briefly that, that I, I've owned um, for a couple of years, and that's GoGo which was the in-flight entertainment provider that you know from all those terrible experiences on American Airlines. Um, but, but what investors might have missed um, as a value investor is thinking about their dominant, almost monopoly-like hold on the business jet market. Um, stock got down to $2. Management indicated, look, we're thinking about separating the business. And uh, lo and behold, they were able to, to sell 
Um, the, the money losing commercial aviation business price doesn't matter because then what you had left was a pure play, $100 million occurring EBITDA business focused on the business aviation business jet market um, that's growing where, and they had a clean balance sheet. And, um, and so that stock is up fivefold in the last two years, something like that. Definitely. And continuing on to our next one here, uh, coming from Jason here out in the audience, are there particular features that you look for now in companies uh, that you invest in as opposed to those that you might have seen in earlier years? Obviously, as everything's been in kind of a crazy transition right now. Yeah, I'm not sure that we've changed much about how we invest. I mean, uh, I suppose maybe there's a greater a, a, a greater appreciation for for technology and how you how you think about um, some of those things. But that's always really been what we've done. I mean, as a firm anyway. Mario was um, one of the early um, investors in in the cable companies, and you know, back in the '80s and '90s, I mean, cable companies. Um, were, were technology stocks, but you understood the cash flow. Um, and some people thought they were expensive, but some thought they were cheap. Um, those that didn't understand um, the merits of, of valuing the business on cash flow versus earnings, taxable earnings, I think missed out on that, that opportunity to own cable companies for, for a very long period of time. Um, you know, owning pet companies, for example, as we do, some of them look awfully expensive. I mean, Chewy on most um, traditional value metrics might seem expensive until you think about the growth in the pet population and the fact that they are changing, dramatically changing the way consumers uh, are able to, um, to take care of their pets, which have become more and more important parts of their lives. Um, and so to me, it looks, it looks cheap. Um, when I think about what they can do over the next three to five years. Absolutely. And uh, a great question here uh, from Praveen out in the audience here. Um, how do you go about sourcing your ideas? Is there a, a specific process for, for finding these investments? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that we have about 35 research analysts whose job it is to scour the planet for, for new ideas by covering one industry, we found that they, they become experts. And so they understand um, who the competitors are. Um, they understand who's doing uh, innovative um, things to, uh, to, to be more competitive. Uh, and then when, especially now, because of what's going on in SPACs, when there are new public investment opportunities, um, for example, in, in the pet industry, uh, I'm guessing if you have a pet, you've heard of BarkBox, uh, one of those um, monthly um, boxes that you can subscribe for a certain amount and they send you a new um, treat and toy um, and uh, they're coming public through a SPAC. Uh, I think that's a really interesting um, new idea that, uh, that we, we've started to, to, to nibble on, on here because the SPACs have all kind of um, pulled back but um, yeah, I mean, there, there is always, you know, by just understanding companies and reading lots of press releases and, uh, I mean, you know, I have, guess I haven't attended conferences in some time, but virtually um, there's a lot of, you know, interesting information out there. So if you're passionate about investing, which I'm guessing that you are, if you're listening to this webcast, there, there's always something to read and, and learn. Definitely. And it uh, looks like a, another one here from Praveen real quick. Um, is there a, an ETF or a, a CEF version of the fund available at this point in time? No, it's just an open-end uh, mutual fund format. Like I said, the symbol is P-E-T-Z-X. Um, the benefit uh, versus an ETF is that uh, ours is actively managed. We can take big positions in micro caps like Kindred uh, that I mentioned uh, versus what an ETF um, can do or not do. Uh, no closed end fund uh, at the moment, um, but you know we would think about doing one or the other. Absolutely. And another question uh, from Jim out here in the audience: uh, Do you have a perspective on PETS or PetMed Express? Uh, he says they there's a PE of twenty three point six percent dividends. 
has fallen and regained some ground over the last year. Uh, he wants to know, would you own it for your own funds, or do you see any value there? Yeah, I mean, uh, it has had quite a nice run. Um, we own a, a small position um, and uh, kind of think about it, but in terms of their competitive positioning, it's not it's not one of our favorite ideas at the moment in the pet fund. Absolutely. I should I should mention too that we we own more than just pure plays in the portfolio. I mean, I own Amazon, for example, um, in the pet parent fund because they're a tremendous uh, retailer of pet products. Um, we own some of the consumer companies that are also in pet food, like Mills that, that bought that bought Blue Buffalo. Um, we own Colgate. Um, we own Smuckers. Uh, we own Nestle because they're in the pet business in, in a big way, even though it's a small piece of their business. For sure. And another question here from Christopher. Um, thanking you right up front for taking the time to, to come and hang out with us today. Um, and asking on uh, for any comments on some of the recent changes in the focus growth and income fund that you manage. Uh, besides the enhanced yield, are you maintaining some of the old names there? <laughs> sure. Um, the symbol on that fund is uh, GWSIX, if you want to follow along at home. Um, we, we converted what was a, uh, an actively managed um, value with a catalyst, event-driven, um, focused portfolio into an income uh, product uh, in January of this year. Um, concentrated 35 names global also, um, managing towards a kind of 5% um, current return, uh, which we think is very attractive in, in the current uh, rate environment. Uh, talking to clients, uh, there is um, an increased appetite for, for yield and doing research, kind of backing into it, thinking about where where dividend paying stocks uh, have gone or not gone really um, the past couple of years. We think there's, there's really a catch up trade there. So we own commons, we own preferreds, um, we own some MLPs, some REITs, uh, even some baby bonds. Um, in this portfolio, and um, we have a monthly uh, distribution of income if that's important to an investor. Um, still own some of the legacy names that we think have material upside, but also um, are now focused on kind of dividend and income paying securities that also kind of have 20, 30% appreciation potential. Definitely. And question here from Jerry. How does macro data influence your investing, and how do you go about position sizing within these portfolios? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the macro data. Um, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about um, about the macro, even though you know it does impact our earnings estimates uh, and the models that all of our analysts maintain and, and build to help us think about value, um, some more than others, if they're um, going to be sensitive to commodity prices, for example, or interest rates to bank stock. But um, but we spend a lot more time thinking about the micro um, and, and whether or not the, the current market, public market price, as we discussed, um, presents an attractive opportunity relative to what we believe it's worth. Um, and that's our own kind of analysis and process for doing that. Um, so that's the first part of the question. The second part, I think, was about sizing positions and, and really it depends on, on the portfolio and the client. Um, I prefer to manage uh, much more concentrated uh, portfolios. Some clients have a preference for otherwise. Um, uh, I manage a small cap strategy uh, for one firm that um, kind of has us in the 50 to 60 positions range. Um, and so sizing would be a bit different there. But, you know, in theory, if we find an investment that we like a lot, in the case of the pet fund, pet IQ, it was mispriced. It was trading down the $20 range um, for, for most of last year, kind of hovering in the low to the 30s. Um, most of the start of this year, it wasn't really until two weeks ago when the Barron's article came out, highlighted the, the disconnect between public and private market prices. Um, that the shares started to react on the upside. And so, you know, having a 9% position when others might have been much more expensive, um, I think with the right 
decision for managing the portfolio, and it's kind of paid off so far. Um, I think the fund was up last year 55% or so, and it's up again another 10 11% this year, um, in part because we have half the portfolio in our top six, seven positions. Absolutely. And a, a question from uh, 180 Project here. As you mentioned, the pandemic has m- impacted the number uh, the numbers significantly in terms of pet ownership. What is your outlook on the industry post-pandemic? Well, I think this is one of the the changes that that's here to stay for for some time. Um, the the record number of uh, fostering, meaning that you're uh, taking a dog into your home for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or adoptions, meaning hopefully, hopefully meaning permanently taking a dog or a cat uh, into your home uh, have obviously increased dramatically during COVID in the past 13 or 14 months, in part because people were home, they want something to do, sounds cool. They're looking at Instagram and Facebook. They see all these cool dog pictures and cat pictures. Um, and I think both from experience and from investing in the industry and understanding um, kind of where the trends are going, uh, there's there's real merit. And my friends that have adopted uh, in the last year or so um, all believe that um, the change in their lives from taking a pet into their home, the companionship that a pet provides um, uh, is is real and it's here to stay. So I would expect that the growth in the industry, which clearly accelerated in the last year, perhaps won't be at the same rate of growth, but will continue, um, uh, especially outside the U.S. as kind of the, the idea and the market matures elsewhere. Definitely. And uh, a question from WK here, uh, one of our usual members out there in the audience. Uh, he says, Kindred has been uh, negative VPS, negative free cash flow for, for eight years now. And it's also seen negative uh, ROE and ROIC. Um, in those types of businesses, what is the best way that our audience members should go about valuing these businesses when those traditional numbers seem uh, a little bit untraditional? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy. Um, but you have to model out the potential uh, cash flow that their pipeline can generate. So you have to go um, one at a time, um, start, starting with atopic dermatitis, for example, what the market is, what their investment in a specific drug um, might generate um, when it's approved. And, and they're on the cusp of getting I think um, several new approvals, uh, which would meaningfully impact their cash flow in 2022 and 2023. But then also think about the value of the pipeline in its entirety and what that would be worth to a potential uh, buyer of that business. So once you prove out, once you get approvals, I mean, they already have several joint ventures with some of the bigger public companies in the pet market. But once you, once you prove out additional applications, um, I think that there is, um, you know, a fair amount of, um, of potential for this company to be consolidated in some fashion. Um, and so you put a, a multiple on what the revenues might be next year or the year after, and that you can discount that back however you choose to do it. And that's how you get to a price that, you know, warrants a 6% position in the pet fund, for example. Absolutely. And it looks like a, another great question here from Praveen. Uh, what is your criteria for selling? How do you decide if something is overvalued? So, for example, here, uh, these posed IDEX, one of your large positions, has really run up. How would you evaluate it? Yeah, I mean, IDEX is a terrific business, but, but you're absolutely right. Um, it's run up. We, uh, we, we trimmed it um, only to be proven wrong every time we've done that, um, of course, because they continue to just kind of innovate and and grow and explore new product categories. Um, I think I think that diagnostics um, is is a really important um, a component to how we're going to care for our pets in the future. Um, and clearly they're a leader 
um, and um, it's hard to uh, to think about sizing the other question versus just outright selling. Um, so you know we've trimmed IDEX a little bit, but um, also when you have inflows in a fund, it kind of naturally becomes a smaller position. Um, we're tax sensitive uh, in terms of selling stocks unless we think there's something fundamentally wrong that that we didn't appreciate when we first bought the stock. Um, so it also kind of goes into our thinking. Definitely. And just to, I guess, kind of continue on that with a, a very long-term focus, obviously, and a lot of these companies have not have been around uh, in these, these funds and portfolios for a while now. What are we looking as far as turnover of these stocks kind of coming in and out? Yeah, I mean, all, all of the, the strategies I manage are very low. Um, turnover and the same would go for Mario and most of my colleagues um, you know, in part because we don't buy um, the stock with the idea that, that they're going to beat the quarter right? we buy it after doing a lot of fundamental analysis with the idea that we want to own this business for three to five plus years and if we're right we can own it much longer because the business and the management team that we are betting on uh, have, have proven us um, Correct in our assessment that they are adept at um, investing for the future, whether that means growth in revenues or the future of their business by kind of focusing on new new areas, and uh, they're doing what's right for for public shareholders. Absolutely, so be happy to own stocks for a very long time. For sure, or forever. And you mentioned uh, SPACs earlier. Any thoughts there with any of the potential regulations coming out uh, here in the future or if these are, are truly going to be value plays moving into the future? Um, I, I don't have a ton of thoughts on potential regulation uh, nor really value I suppose I mean there are now only in the last couple of days or two weeks or so I think uh, a couple of SPACs trading below um, the IPO or cash value so I, think, I guess by classic definition, that would be a value stock. You can make a couple of pennies um, and you have free optionality on the company doing a good deal. Not that I'm an expert on SPACs. Um, otherwise, I mean, it's really, you know, betting on the jockey. I mean, for example, Liberty Media, John Malone, um, and Greg McVeigh have uh, launched a SPAC. Uh, it's trading above cash, but 20%, 30% below where it was trading uh, at the IPO. And uh, that's probably pretty interesting because their ability to do a deal, one would think, is better than really uh, anyone else at the moment. <laughs> they just have great access to, to deal flow and also creative financing. Um, so, um, you know, SPACs are really interesting. I mentioned that I nibbled on uh, the one that is um, going to merge with BarkBox and the Pet Fund. Uh, that's the only one I really own at the moment. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think there's probably going to be some opportunities um, for, sure. for the space. Definitely. And you also mentioned earlier uh, Amazon obviously becoming a, a key player. And um, there's there's news coming out or headlines, I guess, uh, in, the, in the last few days, putting them as uh, taking over as far as, as retailing goes. Do you see the companies are transitioning more to that kind of online retailer model moving into the for, into the future or even potentially going more towards that direct consumer type model? Yeah, I don't see how you can avoid um, adapting a business to offer um, customer preferences for online shopping. Uh, you know, I, everything from groceries, fresh groceries um, to, of course, Clothing and pet food is now available to be delivered to your front door um, same day. <laughs> um, so you know, I, I don't, I don't know in a, in a, in a retail environment um, how you can really stay competitive if you aren't investing in uh, technology in some fashion. Absolutely. And another question from Jim out here in the audience: Do you see any seasonality in the pet business? Not really. I mean, I think, yeah, there are certain periods where you have flea and tick um, or, um, uh, or other, um, other types of um, 
of uh, medical uh, conditions that, that might cause increased trips to the veterinarian. But, but otherwise, it's, it's a terrific business. Uh, one of the reasons why we've invested in it for a long time, one of the reasons why the multiples are so healthy, um, that's because it's, it's a consistent um, grower. And, uh, and we think that there are a number of opportunities to, um, to, to make it a much more dynamic and interesting um, investable area, including technology, including growth of the population. Definitely. And we'll give the, the audience here a few more moments, and I'll, I'll pose one more uh, at you here. You have mentioned uh, it, it being a, a global investment strategy, uh, China specifically seeing some, some potential uh, growth here in the future. Are there any other international regions that you believe are, are going to be kind of key players for the fund moving into the future? I mean, there's not one specific uh, region that I think is, is key to, um, to the growth of the pet market, but uh, I would just say that the U.S. is... Um, is the leader the U.S. is probably, I forget if I gave some numbers earlier, but the U.S. is probably half, um, call it $100 billion of the $200 billion pet economy. And so clearly the U.S. is not half of the world in terms of population, human population. Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot more um, potential for um, societies um, to catch up to the benefits and understand um, the benefits of uh, having a companion pet. <laughs> and when that happens, um, uh, there's probably great opportunities for some of the international names, um, the global uh, producers um, that we're invested in, or even just some of the kind of, you know, European-centric um, firms. One of, one of the best performers, if not the best performer in the portfolio last year, um, was a company called Pets at Home, which is based in London. I visited with the management team two or three times um, when I was over there a couple of years ago, um, you know, they have a terrific hybrid retail care model, similar to kind of what Pet IQ is doing now in the U.S. Um, and and they've just they've won. I mean, they you know maybe a small sell off at the start of COVID, but then it's been it's been a great place to be invested, and I think it will be for some time. Absolutely. And looks like we have a, another few questions rolling in here. Uh, one from WK asking uh, specifically regarding China. Um, I guess what, what are your what are your sources of information there? If you can reveal them or any thoughts on on looking to Alibaba there. Um, we don't have any special sources other than a couple of analysts that uh, are are based um, in Hong Kong and Tokyo and one in Shanghai. Um, publicly available information. Um, we don't have uh, a ton of capital allocated uh, in Asia at the moment. Um, I don't have a view on Alibaba. Definitely. So boots on the ground strategy there. Yeah. Hey, and uh, it looks like we have a, a question from Kathy here in the audience. Um, we did hit on it already, um, but just asking uh, if you have a view into the pet economy opportunity in China um, and any exposure there, if you want to briefly hit on that again. Yeah, again, it's it's not a big exposure. I'd like it to be. Um, we're looking for, for ways to, to make it a bigger part of our portfolio um, because I do think the growth rates will be um, way above average um, the next three to five years. Um, but we don't have um, a name or two that I would share with you that would be kind of pure play exposures. I mean, I think some of the big multinationals, the Zoetuses, for example, um, which is a top position for us, um, will benefit from, from that market. Absolutely. And question here from Blaine out in the audience. And he says that he sees a lot of companies with negative shareholder equities from share repurchases. Is that a negative factor in your analysis? Negative equity from repurchases. No, that, that's not something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, in the, in the pet world, not a lot of the companies are, are buying back their own stock, in part because they're investing in new growth um, in other in industries where we've been invested um, and, uh, and, and are in, involved in companies that are active buyers of their own shares. Um, I haven't 
I haven't really um, seen um, a negative return, at least not in the last couple of years. Definitely. Well, that is going to round out our questions here today from the audience. Uh, for those of you out in the audience, there will be a full recording of this available here on our YouTube channel as well as on Guru Focus. Uh, if you did like the video today, go ahead, give it a like. It really helps out on YouTube there. Comment your favorite part, and if you'd like to, you can subscribe for future com content. Uh, Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us today and, and taking the time to answer all these questions for our audience. Uh, like I said, it's, it's been a pleasure. Good questions. I appreciate them. Absolutely. And for those out in the audience, we thank you for joining us as well, and we wish everybody well moving into the future.